Our scripture reading for this Easter morning can be found in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel, verses 1 through 18. Prepare your heart and mind for the reading of holy text. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It doesn't happen every year, but there are many Easter weeks, Holy Weeks, that also are Master's Weeks. And that's where we are right now. I know some people are probably sneaking a peek every now and then at their smartphone to see where things lie. You know, I grew up in Aiken, South Carolina, just across the river uh, from Augusta, Georgia. And for us, it didn't matter when, when spring break was for everybody else, it was always Master's Week for us. Spring break, Master's Week, Easter, it all kind of makes me think about home. I know a few people even went there this week. You know, I, I've been paying attention a little bit more this season to the golfers, 
it may have been just that I've got a little bit more time every now and then, but also because the documentary Full Swing came out on Netflix. And I found it really interesting that in this documentary that happened based on last year's season, there was a lot of talk about mindset. There was a lot of talk about how, is my mic okay? <laughs> okay. Um, there was a lot of talk about how, how the players are all so talented. They're so gifted. They're so capable, almost equally capable, that really there's just a minuscule difference between so many of them. I mean, think about, if you've been following the Masters this week, you know that until this morning, the third place player was an amateur, somebody who was not even a part of the tour. One of the things they, they said about all these players, if it's, if it's not about ability, what is it about? You know, sometimes it is about people's physical ability at that time. I mean, some people had to pull out of the masters because of injuries. So what is it about? So many of them reported it's all about a mindset. It's their belief that they can accomplish the things that they have set out to do. They pay millions of dollars for sports psychologists to help rev them up and to help them silence those negative voices in their head because you can see it sometimes when one bad shot leads to negative thoughts that leads to a bad shot and another and another and it just starts compounding. This is not something new. This has always been a part of people bringing their A game into whatever they face. But it seems to be more prevalent. I mean, think about how one of the biggest words in the past two years has been the one that's right above the doorway to Ted Lasso's office. Believe. There's something about a mindset that can set you on a good course or a bad course. On Easter morning, that first Easter morning, Mary, we find her weeping outside of the tomb. Now, she is, is not tearing up. She is wailing. She is crying. She is upset. I mean, it would be odd if she did not act in this way. She's upset because her master, her friend, her rabbi, the person that she believed was the Messiah, not only was crucified and buried on Friday, but now his body is missing. She's weeping. It's logical. It makes all the sense of the world when you think about it. Before she weeps, she comes to the tomb and finds the stone rolled away. Before she even looks in, she runs to get the disciples who are cowering in fear, locked in a home somewhere nearby, out of fear because maybe the very same people that took Jesus, imprisoned him, and crucified him might come looking for them as well. You can tell that they are so afraid because only two of the disciples leave the safety of where they are to go to the tomb. Simon Peter, Peter, and the beloved disciple. And it's really funny because if you read the passage, the beloved disciple, who some people believe is John, the author, outruns Peter. It's a little humble brag, if you will, in Scripture. He gets to the tomb first. Peter goes in. The beloved disciple go in. They don't see anything other than what they've heard. The tomb is empty, and the clothes, the linen wrappings, are there. They leave. They go back. And it's only Mary who stays and she's weeping, weeping outside of the tomb. And I don't know why, because I don't know what she expected to see. But as she's weeping, she looks up and looks into the tomb. And that's when she sees two people dressed all in white, who we know as angels. But she may not have realized that at the moment. And she sees them and they say to her, why are you weeping? She's not asked that question only by the angel. She's also asked by Jesus who walks up to her. And she supposes he's a gardener. 
Now, why a gardener? Well, scholars believe that the reason for that is because the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea gave for Jesus to be buried in was next to an olive grove or a vineyard. And a gardener would have been there to take care of both of those things. So she thought it was a gardener. She didn't realize it was Jesus. She didn't make the connection. And he also asked her, woman, why are you weeping? Isn't it obvious why she's weeping? She's been hit with the double whammy. Good Friday, he has died. Now Easter Sunday, his body is missing. It's logical for her to weep. So why would Jesus and the angels ask such a question? In the same gospel, the gospel of John in the fifth chapter, Jesus encounters a man who's been waiting to get healed for 38 years. There is a pool where he believes he can be healed, but he is not able to physically pick himself up and put himself in the water. So for 38 years, he's hoping that the kindness of someone else would help him get into the water, and no one has helped him. Everybody else has rushed past him to try to get themselves healed. For 38 years, he has sat there by that pool. And Jesus sees him, and Jesus knows what's going on. He is the Son of God, and he says, do you want to get healed? Yes, he wants to get healed. (laughs) It's an obvious question. So why is Jesus asking obvious questions? Unless it points to something we need to understand. Something's out of place. The man is looking to get healed in a pool when the very person who can heal him is right in front of him. And for Mary, she's weeping on Easter Sunday. It's not her fault. She doesn't know yet what's really truly happened. Maybe Jesus is pointing out for others and for us that the weeping does not belong because of what has just happened. That doesn't mean that her weeping is out of place. Again, we've said it's logical. Instead, the mindset of despair, of disillusionment. That is what is out of place on Easter Sunday. Think about the disciples. They are hiding that very day. Only two of them, I said, come out. The rest of them hide in that same place until Jesus physically appears to them later in the Gospels. That's when they feel courageous enough to get out. They are huddled in fear. They are in despair, disillusioned. They are locked into their own despair. And because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they change. There's a a marketed difference. Rick Warren mentions this in one of his sermons on Easter. He says that they were full of despair and disillusionment. But after Easter, after they know that Jesus is raised, they become courageous and contagious, filled with with hope. You see, the Easter mindset is different than the Good Friday mindset. And Mary doesn't understand yet that it's Easter. She's still in Good Friday. But maybe Jesus is asking the question so that we will think about our own lives, our own faith, our own mindset. Where are we on this Easter Sunday? Is our mindset in despair? Or is it in hope? Mary and her tears are logical, but her mindset is out of place at Easter. The mindset of Good Friday is the world is falling apart. There is no hope. Without Easter Sunday, Good Friday is but the death of a great and wonderful Messiah. But with Easter Sunday, He is the risen king, is he not? This becomes central to the preaching of all of the disciples as they go out into the world. They go out into the world preaching Jesus crucified and risen. And that's exactly what this church preaches to this day. Christ our Lord was crucified and was risen The Good Friday has meaning because of what happened today. It has power and significance because Jesus gave himself up for us on the cross and it was sealed with victory because of Sunday. 
But the mindset, if we take Good Friday in isolation, is despair, disillusionment, discouragement, fear. We preach it and teach it here because we believe it to be true. Think about the Apostles' Creed that we said together. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Paul and other disciples and apostles preach that Jesus was risen and they can have hope. And this hope, this victory, this this beautiful story of God's love for us is interwoven into everything that we do at Easter. Every song that was written, every sermon that has been preached, hopefully, is one of hope and optimism because of what God did through Jesus. It would be a pretty, pretty sad service if our choir and our brass did not sing and play with joyous hope that Christ our Lord is risen today. Do you see the connection? The Easter mindset is one of hope and victory, not of despair and disillusionment. Paul, in the book of Romans, chapter 15, is writing to the people in Rome, the Christians in Rome, and he's telling them that they are people who are touched by God's grace and mercy. And if you haven't read Romans, it's a beautiful passage, beautiful letter with all this theological insight. But really what Paul is doing is trying to give courage and hope to people to live faithfully to Jesus throughout their lives in this place, in Rome, the very heart of the Roman Empire. And in this passage, in Romans 15, verses 12 through 13, Paul says something very important that's related to our message for Easter. He says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. And the next slide is, in him the Gentiles shall have hope. And this is where he changes. He starts talking to bless and pray for the people in the church in Rome. He says, may the God of hope fill you all, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. What what Paul is saying is, is that the people in Rome, these Christians need to be filled with hope. They need to be filled with so much hope that they abound in it. There's an abundance. One way of translating that word in Greek is to excel in hope. Christians should excel in hope. We should not excel in despair, in negativity, or cynicism. We should excel in hope. Why? Paul makes it clear, because Jesus was raised from the dead on Easter. A recent pastor and author and sort of online guru for church leadership and growth, Kerry Newhoff, says that Christians should be the least cynical people in the world. Think about that for a minute, that Christians, if you meet a Christian on the street, they should be the least cynical person in the world. They should be the most filled with hope anywhere. Christians should have an Easter mindset and not a Good Friday mindset. Hope should be infused into who we are and what we are. Now, that does not mean that we won't have moments in an Easter mindset of being filled with tears, to be sad, to have some moments of despair. Sometimes in our lives, there are difficult paths to walk through, but we do not walk through those valleys as people without hope. When we go through difficulty, when we are having moments of despair or even relationships that are falling apart, we can, with hope, believe that God can help repair them that we can invest in them again, that we can be honest with ourselves or we can be honest with others. Maybe even we need to turn to a counselor because we cannot get out of this cycle of negative thinking and 
we need to be liberated from that because God clearly does not want his people to be trapped in a cycle of despair. He wants us to understand the victory of Jesus on the cross and in the empty tomb is to give us all hope for today and hope for eternity. It's not just about hope for eternal life in heaven or in the resurrection of our bodies. It is about hope for now as well. It's a hope that doesn't make sense based on Good Friday. It's a hope that does make sense because God has done the impossible and raised his son from the tomb. That same author, that same author, Kerry Newhoff, wrote an article about cynicism in Christianity. And he has this last message that I want to share with you. He says, so here's my plea. Hope again, believe again, trust again. And when hope flourishes, cynicism doesn't stand a chance. Maybe this Easter is a chance for us all to hope again, to believe again, to trust again. With whatever we've been carrying, with any negativity or despair or cynicism that we've been carrying, maybe it needs to be nailed to the cross of Friday. And maybe we need to find something brand new, hopeful, optimistic, fruitful, beautiful. Freed because God raised his son on Easter Sunday. The Easter mindset is one focused on what God can do, what God has promised for us and for the whole world. It gives us the ability to walk through those valleys. It gives us the ability to endure some of those negative experiences in life because we know that God has already overcome whatever we face. I hope and pray that we can all take with us this message of hope today, this message of truth, that we're preaching Christ crucified but also raised from the dead. And that there are no more dead ends for any of us because Mary found out, because the disciples saw and touched with their own hands. Their Messiah, their Lord, the very Son of God, Jesus, was raised from the dead. And God has won. There is hope. There is always hope. And let us all be agents of that hope. The world may seem like a dark place sometimes, but we, friends, Christians, can be like those little kids shining those flashlights right at me while I'm preaching. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> we can shine our light and remind people. God is a God of hope, and we're called to excel in hope.